Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to wherever you are around the world. I know we have a international audience this evening for this very exciting presentation, but Dr. Burris and the panel session to follow with our distinguished visitors. Uh, my name is Dr. Peter Yu. I am a medical oncologist and physician in chief of the Hartford Healthcare Cancer Institute in Connecticut in the United States of America. It is my honor to chair this meeting today sponsored by eChina Health. Our, our agenda this evening will start with a keynote presentation by Dr. Burris, uh, followed by a panel discussion with uh, three members moderated by myself. We also would like to recognize and acknowledge uh, the generous sponsors of this meeting this evening or the evening here in, in Connecticut, at least, uh, that you can see listed um, uh, on this slide. So uh, some uh, little host housekeeping, as we call it. Uh, there, are, um, there is the ability in this virtual meeting to pose questions for the panelists. And we hope that we have many, many questions uh, after the exciting presentation by Dr. Burris. Uh, you can enter these questions directly into the uh, Q&A window and uh, we will um, scroll through them and relay them uh, to the panelists. With that, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker without further ado, Dr. Howard or Skip Burris. It's been my pleasure to have known Dr. Burris for virtually all of my, my personal career in, in oncology. Uh, and uh, I can speak with great familiarity uh, to his uh, really groundbreaking role in um, development of medical ecology in the United States of America. Uh, Dr. Burroughs uh, really needs no introduction uh, for his outstanding work over the years in phase one and early trial drug development, uh, bringing or uh, participating in uh, the launch of many, many of the drugs that we now take for granted uh, today around the world. Uh, Dr. Burroughs uh, uh, is a graduate of the US Military Academy at West Point. Um, and after his military service, uh, obtained his medical degree at the University of South Alabama. Uh, he then completed a fellowship uh, at the Brooke Army Medical Center in San Antonio, um, a institution well known for its phase one uh, early development work. And uh, while in Texas, he served as the director of clinical research at the Institute of Drug Development um, of the um, uh, University of Texas Health Center. Uh, following that, uh, Skip moved to Tennessee uh, to join Tennessee Oncology and to launch um, really the first phase one study program done in a uh, community oncology setting in the United States. Um, uh, and even to this day, um, perhaps most uh, phase one drug development uh, is typically found in a selected few academic centers. Um, but Dr. Burris um, helped to pioneer uh, the, the ability to launch and conduct phase one studies uh, virtually anywhere in the United States in any hospital or community setting uh, that had the dedicated resource and commitment uh, for early drug development. Um, that uh, initial program in Tennessee uh, grew into what is now known as the Sarah, Sarah Cannon Research Institute. Uh, Dr. Burris has authored over 400 publications uh, related to uh, early drug development. Uh, Dr. Burris is also known as uh, past president of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, uh, 2019 to 2020, uh, and is, as the society's um, uh, um, tradition, now serves as uh, chairman of the board directors uh, of ASCO. Uh, without uh, any further uh, explanation or, or detail, I will uh, turn this uh, session over to Dr. Burris. Uh, for his keynote presentation. Thank you very, very much, Peter. I, I appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate the kind words. I think the key part of this conversation tonight is going to be around the panel discussion. So I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes. I really want to present some overarching topics to stimulate conversation and hopefully generate some questions. Uh, as, in terms of where we're heading with the next best thing in, in cancer care, a number of things come to mind. We are certainly beginning to get very interested in 
uh, circulating tumor DNA in the early detection of cancer. So companies you've heard of such as Grail and Thrive and Freenome, those are exciting. We're also doing more and more work um, in the cellular therapies with CAR therapy and the uh, treatments that are coming forward with uh, actually beginning to even personalize that to individual patients. But I think really the next best thing in oncology, big thing in oncology is going to be continuing to refine the individualized approach. And tonight I'm gonna to highlight um, some examples and also talk about how more and more commonly we're beginning to become tumor agnostic in our approach to treating our cancer patients. And we're thinking about what specifically is driving that patient's biology as opposed to being concerned about whether the tumor origin was from breast cancer, lung cancer, or the like. Uh, my personal disclosures are listed here. Um, I have no financial personal uh, conflicts, but Sarah Cannon does work with a number of biotech companies, a number of pharma companies for which we conduct their clinical research. As we look at the changing landscape, uh, my career, uh, and as Peter uh, nicely alluded to, uh, we've known each other a long time. I talk about the 90s as being the era of weekly Taxol. Um, we had the emergence of new chemotherapy drugs, the Taxane, gemcitabine, the topoisomerase inhibitors, and we spent much of that decade rearranging drugs within chemotherapy regimens. Um, we've now moved quickly to a, a era of pills and checkpoint inhibitors, targeted uh, agents, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, immunotherapy, and chemotherapy is even becoming more and more commonly given as an antibody drug conjugate. Drug development is really no longer phase one to three. It's actually first demand a proof of concept. And then once that proof of concept is defined, we begin to think about what unique group of patients will benefit from that treatment. And I'll highlight how small some trials have become. And we've certainly gone from one size fits all to a personalized approach driven by the patient's biology. This landmark study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2002, not really that long ago, a number of friends that were authors on this publication, and we're not gonna see studies like this um, much anymore. These are gonna be rare as opposed to being the, the typical large randomized uh, result. You see here curves that are highly overlapping, over a thousand patients trying to pull out the differences between these different chemotherapy drugs. Interesting, in the New England Journal of Medicine just 20 years ago. At the time that trial was being accrued in the late 90s, 1998, I remember we had articles talking about how easy it was to get a drug approved, eight drug approvals in 1998. So then fast forward over the next 20 years, and we actually had 49 approvals in 2018, and that set a record and was certainly a big news story, number of therapies available to patients. And then if we look at what's happened over the last few years, this rolling list of studies, not meant to be able to be read, just the shock effect of these are single arm clinical trials that led to the approval of individual agents. It's an amazing story. You see numbers as small as 20 to 30 patients, up to 100 patients, again, but because we can identify the specific group of patients to benefit, we have good response rates, good durations of response, short of survival data in many of these settings, but knowing in fact that we're treating the right patient with the right therapy. In 2020, we ended up with 59 oncology drug approvals at the Food and Drug Administration, 17 novel agents, some new formulations, and yet another tumor agnostic approval, additional checkpoint inhibitor approvals across a variety of tumor types and scenarios, additional antibody drug conjugates, another autologous T-cell immunotherapy, uh, oral TKIs, and then interestingly, 26 of these 59 approvals are tied to a molecular test. And I think that's really a key part of what we need to understand when we go about treating relapse and refractory cancer patients. So what's the next big thing in oncology? I, I think it really is this understanding and coming to fruition that biology is destiny for these patients' tumors, the molecular targets, molecular profiling, and going about it with tumor agnostic trial strategies and therapies. We're moving more and more in the direction, as I said, in terms of thinking about what's driving that particular patient's cancer, as opposed to being as worried about the site of origin, particularly in the relapsed metastatic refractory setting. 
The biomarker success is a precision medicine, a busy slide, but just to highlight the range of disease sites, breast, leukemia, melanoma, smaller tumor types such as cholangiocarcinoma, being tied to a variety of markers ranging from microsatellite instability and uh, tumor mutational burden to very specific med exon 14 mutations, EZH2, um, just a, the, a variety across the waterfront. So obviously the opportunity here to begin to understand more and more that each individual tumor certainly has a variety of potential areas where we see activity. Doesn't seem that long ago that the trastuzumab approval for the first HER2 targeted therapy was upon us. Uh, again, this is the results of the adjuvant trial that led to really actually talking about curing many more patients with what was thought to be a very poor prognostic factor. The hazard ratio, the p-value, um, the separation of the curves, uh, a trial never to be repeated, and one thought that this was the end of the story for many patients with HER2 targeted therapy. And yet, look at this list from just this past year, um, agents targeting HER2, antibodies, new antibodies, other antibody drug conjugates, small molecules, other drugs that are affecting the HER2 pathway through different mechanisms. So we're seeing upstream, downstream, receptors and the like. Again, just the, the whole spectrum of the possibility and the vast number of agents uh, that have been are being developed and a number of that have been approved to in fact attack this particular tumor target. And these are the HER2 alterations across a variety of tumor types. Again, too small to read. The point here is simply that it's far beyond the breath story. Um, on the top side, you see amplication frequency. Uh, on the far left, esophagogastric and breast, but we've had a number of salivary and bladder cancer patients benefit all the way across the appendiceal tumors, and even some other less commonly found cancers. On the bottom of the slide is mutational frequency. We see the highest mutational frequency is actually in bladder and small bowel carcinoma. And we're beginning to have targeted small molecules that are pulling out and looking at very specific, specific mutations in this HER2 uh, area. So this has become not just a receptor story, not just an amplification story, but much like other disease settings, beginning to understand very specific mutations. So HER2 now really a tumor agnostic approach for many of these new therapies. So why do we need to profile the patients? I hope you've seen from the first introductory slides that in fact, we need to do it for the patient and the individual benefit that we, we can attain by identifying what is needed for that patient. But we also need to do it for clinical research and drug development. We find that molecularly profiling patients is really often the starting conversation to get a patient enrolled on a clinical trial. And then it's really only by accumulating the molecular data on these patients that we can really begin to understand biology and resistance and where we need to go with the next stages of drug development. So profiling these patients and compiling this data is really for the benefit of all of us and particularly the patients that are experiencing this disease. There are more and more FDA-approved tumor profiling tests. We have a number of experts on our panel tonight who are involved in genetic sequencing and looking at uh, these, these stories. Um, just to put up here, just these are the ones that are FDA-approved now. A variety of companies and a variety of tests, blood-based and solid tissue. Uh, so again, more and more opportunities and certainly a number of investigational panels still being evaluated. I like to think about approach to the cancer patients in the relapse refractory setting as two trends with one real triage decision driven by what we find on a next generation sequencing profile. Really pushing the patient's therapy either in the direction of precision medicine or immunotherapy and occasionally the combination of the two. So we'll talk a little bit about this as we roll through some of the next scenarios. The challenge of precision medicine, uh, an old slide from now over five years ago, but the story hasn't changed much. And I think what's become of interest, uh, frustration for some as they profile patients, but when um, driver mutations discovered in this group that are in the yellow, the less than 2%, it's 100% for that individual patient. So on that far right side of the curve are some less common mutations, uh, such as TREK and RET, but those are certainly stories that are very, very relevant 
for the patient that sits in front of you in clinic that can only be detected through molecular profiling. We made a decision at Sarah Canman to invest in bioinformatics to accumulate this data. So Genospace was brought into Sarah Cannon, the computational biology lab that came out of the Harvard system, a decision support tool. Uh, at the top of the slide, you see large scale clinical genomic data aggregation. Every one of our patients' medical records and their molecular profiles are brought into this database. And the accumulation of that data allows us to look at um, discoveries and look at trial recruitment. We uh, curate all of our clinical trials to provide a menu of potential matches for the physicians and research nurses, ultimately leading to this clinical decision support. And I like to think of data to insights to action really being wisdom as to what's best to be done for our patients. We've also invested in what I think is going to be coming an increasingly new norm around the world. Instead of having breast cancer tumor boards or conferences, lung cancer thoracic conferences, that actually these molecular tumor boards are going to be so important. Um, they are a place where, again, we're beginning to learn what to do and not to do, what trials to consider. Uh, many of the most valuable learnings from these tumor conferences are the potential contraindications for prescribing some of these therapies for patients and also beginning to sort out somatic versus germline mutations. But um, there's a number of paired uh, abnormalities that are coming together and it's just a, a better way to begin to discuss which patients should be treated in the relapse setting uh, often or what clinical trial might be most appropriate. I'll give you two very quick examples that just highlight how important it can be to translate this information from the genomic profile to the patient treating, uh, being treated in the clinic. This is an example of a colon adenocarcinoma. On the left side, you see uh, microsatellite stable and a fairly low mutational burden and a number of genomic findings, the KRAS wild type tumor. But most importantly here, our personalized medicine team identified that this was a BRAF F595L or class three mutation that results in BRAF loss of function and overactivation of downstream mech ERK pathways, resistant to BRAF targeted therapy. So one might say BRAF mutation prescribe a BRAF inhibitor, when in case that would not be the prudent thing to do. And actually some of the agents being studied such as ERK inhibitors and SHIP2 inhibitors on clinical trials might be a better choice. And the setting of lung adenocarcinoma. This is an interesting case that presents the fact that we've got multiple opportunities here. This is actually a patient who's microsatellite stable, but has a fairly high tumor mutational burden at 26. There's clinical trial and standard of care opportunities that are available. Interestingly, ERB2 amplification, 50 copies. And so uh, HER2 targeted therapy, whether the patient had had prior immunotherapy or not, might be something to consider. And then there's some other findings, but in particular, what's on here are N-TRAC amplifications. And we know right now for the agents we have available, it's really the N-TRAC mutation that's a candidate. The amplifications aren't actionable. Of note, we're beginning to have clinical trials combining checkpoint inhibitors with some of the HER2 targeted agents, actually some of the HER2 ADCs being given in combination with some of those checkpoint inhibitors. I'll just quickly mention the tumor agnostic approval of larotrectinib. Um, we've heard this story, uh, two very different cases presented here. Top left, an adenocarcinoma in a, a female patient, uh, symptomatic and had resolution of symptoms and shrinkage of disease, uh, a more common tumor type where we found this unusual fusion. And then in the bottom right, we see in fact, uh, a patient with the infantile form of breast carcinoma uh, multiple lines of chemotherapy found to have the NTRAC mutation, and you see the marked shrinkage over just the first few weeks of therapy. I think the, the TREC story is just uh, enthusiasm for beginning to further profile and try to identify these driver mutations that do occur. And the important part to remember here is that the TREC fusions have come across a variety of different tumor types, from appendiceal to lung to GIST to some of these pediatric tumors response rate of almost 
Uh, tumor mutational burden uh, continues to be debated. We have seen, and this is only can only be obtained through next generation sequencing. We've debated. It's been in favor, out of favor. The numbers have been debated. Is 20 the cutoff? Is 10 the cutoff? And how does it correlate to MSI status, microsatellite instability status? It's interesting, the correlation between tumor material burden and response to PD-1 inhibition. This uh, publication highlighted the tumor mutational burden across the, the bottom axis, across the y-axis, you see the response rates. And not surprisingly, we've seen approvals for checkpoint inhibitors with cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, which is in the very top right of the screen. Also in some of the MSI high colorectal carcinomas, you see melanoma in that direction. And bottom left, places where we haven't seen the activity that we'd hoped in a tumor such as sarcoma, pancreatic carcinoma, or the uveal melanomas. So there is a trend here, and I do think we've begun to see that there is some relevance to in fact understand the tumor mutational burden of your patient. And remember, MSI high specimens are just a subset of the high TMB specimens. Actually, TMB high in this publication was defined as greater than 20, and only 14% of the TMB high, tumor mutational burden high specimens were also MSI high. So MSI high, important to understand, very specific group, high likelihood of benefiting, but not a, a surrogate for being tumor mutational burden high. This was the uh, initial tumor agnostic approval for pembrolizumab based on MSI high status or mismatch repair deficiency. I think a couple caveats from this slide. One is tumor agnostic, uh, certainly a novel approval at the time, the first of its kind in 2017, but actually comprising 60,000 patients per year. So more than tumor types that we think of as common, such as ovarian cancer and pancreatic cancer in the United States. So about 60,000 folks per year, 4% of all cancers that are MSI high or mismatch repair deficient, and, and thus a, a population, a, a disease uh, in and of itself. Recently, uh, and I was a bit surprised by this, but uh, we can work with, with how to expand on improving the reliability here. The FDA uh, expanded the approval of pembrolizumab in a tumor agnostic setting for those patients that simply had a tumor mutational burden greater than or equal to 10. Response rate was lower than we saw with the MSI high at 29%, but if you respond, you tend to respond for a fairly long period of time. And duration of the response is at greater than two years of 50%. So pretty well tolerated therapy, and thus patients getting some great benefit if they are someone who's lucky enough to respond to this treatment in this setting. We have done some work at Sarah Cannon. This is more than 20,000 patients where we've looked at next generation sequencing. I put this up here just to mention that by and large, I believe still that tumor mutational burden is going to vary based on uh, the tumor of origin. It, it, there's going to be some correlations between where we see it being much higher in melanoma and some lung and bladder cancers to the far right, and less so in some of the tumors to the left, such as ovarian and breast carcinoma. So I think in and of itself, it appears that within individual tumors, there's likely to be different correlations. And this is just an overall look at the data, looking at uh, this uh, Fleming plot, increased benefit from IO immunotherapy or decreased benefit. One can see that the low and stable less benefit, intermediate, not too far off the, the median line, but MSI high and TMB high patients both benefiting. Nothing surprising here. This is just a non-clinical trial setting. These are just patients being treated in oncologist offices that have had next generation sequencing. And we can see if what we find in clinical trials actually holds up in current practice. I wanna shift gears and just talk about the vast opportunities with tumor agnostic approvals. Um, we know that there are likely to be tyrosine kinase inhibitor tumor agnostic approvals uh, with targets such as TREC, RET, KRAS. Whether that needs to be three or more tumor types and what type of biomarker remains in debate, but we know we've got mutations like that that in fact cross across a number of different sites of origin. Certainly personalized cancer vaccines, of which we've worked with a number, including some of those that have brought us the COVID vaccines, companies such as BioNTech and Moderna, uh, and seen encouraging information. Again, a very personalized approach of giving a cancer vaccine built upon the next generation sequencing of a patient's tumor. 
cellular therapies, the CAR Ts, the TCRs, as they are moving into solid tumors, again, based much more on the biomarker as opposed to the site of origin, antibody-based therapies, bispecifics and trispecifics, and the antibody drug conjugates. And I'll highlight some examples. Potential tumor targets uh, here look molecularly, cellular therapy, and for antibody drug conjugates as listed. Again, a growing number of, of molecular targets, a growing number of uh, CAR therapy targets or T cell receptor targets that uh, you know, are, are really just now in the clinical trials. And then the antibody drug conjugate story. I think we're doing better with some of the payloads and some of the technology. And I think we're gonna see more and more of a tumor agnostic approach and a better way to deliver chemotherapy. It's been years and years we've talked about the undruggable KRAS target. And yet now at the last few uh, international meetings, we've begun to see results from these G212C inhibitors. There's more drugs to come in the setting. There's a lot of enthusiasm around the SOS inhibitors and other variations of attacking KRAS. Uh, looks different in lung and pancreas and colon, but that being what it is, I think with modern chemistry, there's likely not to be a target that can't be drugged, which is a real positive advance. I mentioned the personalized neoantigen vaccines. Again, this has been a fascinating story, a long way to go here. There's great opportunities to think about this being brought into the neoadjuvant and adjuvant setting. Um, you see some of the companies that are in clinical trials here with these agents. Uh, some of this data has been talked about and presented, but a lot of enthusiasm here and just the, the next level of personalized approach that we're going to see utilizing some of these vaccine technologies. And then the antibody-based cancer-directed therapy. If we just roll around what we see on this slide, again, Many of the targets here, looking at combinations with bispecifics of CD3 plus a molecular target, things like CEA and HER2 that are found across a variety of different uh, disease entities. So we've got simple antibodies to bispecifics, to the trispecifics, to the bispecific T cell engagers, and then the CAR Ts. Um, and I think we've just begun to understand what the possibilities are here, but very likely that these will be more biomarker driven than disease site of origin driven. And this just highlights some of those solid tumor targets. We have 15 of these trials that are open right now at Sarah Cannon. And we're beginning to see more and more excitement and some dramatic responses in occasional patients, needing to understand who's gonna benefit and who doesn't. NY ESO, MUC, PSMA has been getting a, a great deal of uh, enthusiasm and publication about it. And of course, some of the other ones I mentioned such as HER2. And the tumor agnostic cellular therapy is being developed by a number of pharma biotechs. Again, we won't get in the interest of time for the data, but you've got a variety of approaches that are ongoing here, led by a number of the companies that are here on this slide. Uh, we've got off the shell red cell approaches with companies like Rubius. We've got apheresis and personalized manufactured approaches from a number of these companies. But again, we're gonna see more and more tumor agnostic cellular therapy moving forward. A quick comment on the antibody drug conjugates. Uh, this educated audience and our panel certainly understands the, the possibilities here. Um, the imagination really is the only thing that limits what we could do with regard to antibodies, uh, looking at better tolerated payloads and linkers that are stable in circulation but enable the cytotoxic to be released. I, I would say it's fair that the DS8201 molecules received a lot of the press over the last year and a half interesting and initially approved in the treatment of uh, refractory HER2 breast cancer. This one, in fact, uh, the trastuzumab type antibody linked to an exotecan or topoisomerase-1 campothecin-like uh, payload with a unique drug linker. This is interesting, as I highlighted at the very beginning, seeing some of the activity and the opportunities for HER2. This was some of the initial publications. You've seen the uh, approvals now in breast cancer, but we need to continue to study and look at the fact that this antibody drug conjugate targeting HER2 therapy, not just was beneficial in HER2 positive or overexpressing amplified breast cancer, but in the quote unquote HER2 low population and HER2 positive gastric cancer and a number of other cancers, in particularly colorectal and non-small cell lung cancer, 
where HER2 overexpression amplification is not a small matter. Um, in this overall group of patients, half the patients uh, th had a confirmed response and over 85% of the patients had some tumor shrinkage. So certainly uh, a great example of a tumor agnostic HER2 ADC. I'll wrap up just by mentioning uh, where we're heading with some of the next generation genomic trial designs. Uh, there's the basket studies where we've got a one therapy and a variety of different tumor types that are being pursued. Think of just that recent DS8201 slide I showed you and the number of different tumors accrued. But more commonly, we're seeing what I would call the umbrella trial, which is where we've got uh, a whole host of patients where the molecular targeting next generation sequencing is deciding which one of a variety of therapies they should pursue. At Sarah Cannon, we've published the My Pathway study, which looked at a, a variety of the commercially approved drugs in the Roche Genentech portfolio and matched those in an off-label setting to uh, community oncologists' discoveries with genomic sequencing. And a number of responses were observed. Probably the largest trial in the US that's getting some notoriety, over 2,000 patients accrued to the ASCO paper trial uh, across much of the country in numerous locations bringing uh, the combination of next generation sequencing and investigational approaches. All of the drugs in this trial are approved in an indication, and then patients are enrolled in off-label settings. And this slide highlights the different treatments, the different cancers being approached, the variants that are being looked at, um, and then what the findings are. Some of the arms have been closed for being negative, some are ongoing and pending, and some have been positive with the arms wrapped up, published, and next decisions being made. Well, the first one that highlights that here is the understanding of the effectiveness of the PARP inhibitor, Olaparib, in the prostate setting um, in patients that have BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations. And then some of the current cohorts being explored just highlighted here. Uh, no reason to get into details, but again, some of the variants beginning to look at some of the FGFR abnormalities and the CDK, CDK, and abnormalities uh, for which we've got therapies that might be very, very relevant. So I'll conclude there. Hopefully I stimulated some thoughts and some questions. Uh, we've got a distinguished panel to discuss some of these topics. I think to conclude, biology as destiny is influencing drug development strategies as we see these tumor agnostic approaches become mainstream. Identification of the molecular targets and tumors with NGS is certainly accelerating the development of these therapies. And we've got a number of different entities from cellular to vaccines, ADCs and small molecules that are all gonna play roles either alone or in combination in treating these cancers irrespective of tumor size. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Yu to lead our discussion. Thank you, Skip, uh, for that uh, um, really wonderful tour de force, I would say, uh, presentation of, um, uh, of where we are in the landscape today. Uh, we're going to now go into the uh, panel discussion, and I'm going to start by introducing our two additional panel members, uh, many of whom are familiar. Uh, I saw while you were speaking, Skip, that we have about 200 people um, on, the, um, uh, on, the, on the web session here today, um, and uh, I'm sure many, many are familiar with both of our distinguished panelists, Dr. Elong Wu is a tenured professor at the Guangdong Provincial People's Hospital, the Guangdong Academy of Medical Sciences, and the Guangdong Lung Cancer Institute. He is, of course, a well-known well expert in the field of thoracic malignancies. Um, he is a graduate of the Sun Yat-sen University of Medical Sciences uh, and a past president of the Chinese Society of Clinical Oncology, or CISCO, uh, has been a uh, long partner with uh, ASCO um, in, in, uh, in our endeavors and have been a strong supporter uh, of oncology societies uh, across the world. Uh, he has been a principal investigator over, of over 200 international um, and national clinical trials uh, and serves on the editorial board of many of distinguished uh, journals, including, uh, uh, including the Journal of Immunotherapy of Cancer, uh, the Journal of SITSI, uh, the Oncologist, um, uh, Nature Review, Clinical Oncology, uh, and he is Deputy Editor of uh, Lung Cancer. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to have Dr. Wu with us today, and, uh, uh, and we may skew some of our discussions towards thoracic malignancies because of that, which is fine. Um, uh, also joining us is Dr. Yang Xiao. 
um, who is um, uh, a member of the faculty at the University of Toronto uh, with a um, specialty in cancer genomics. Uh, he is distinguished professor and a member of the board of directors of Nanjing Medical University. Uh, he has been honored uh, uh, by being listed by Forbes magazine uh, as uh, among the 30 prominent leaders under 30 uh, in Asia in, 20, 000, uh, in 2017. Um, he is an entrepreneur and owner of 14 uh, NGS-related uh, innovation patents uh, and um, brings a very unique perspective uh, to our meeting uh, this evening. So I am uh, uh, going to start uh, the question to our panelists. And what I, I think what I'll do is I will um, ask each of our panelists, and I will start with this, to um, uh, ask one question related to Skip's uh, um, presentation while it's all fresh in our minds. So what was the one comment he made or the one slide he presented that, that made you pause and think a bit about, uh, about something? And so uh, Skip, my question with you goes to one of your middle slides um, where you talked about the, uh, you know, the complexity of uh, uh, analyzing mutations, getting these reports with many mutations. Some of them are not actionable, uh, even though they are a mutation. Uh, some of them actually indicate you should not give the drug. Uh, common problems with uh, um, the TREC uh, mutations. Uh, people need to understand that's really the translocation that you're looking for. So that kind of uh, complexity and um, you showed the slide of the molecular tumor board um, uh, as a good form for helping people to understand this, this complexity. So um, like two questions related to that are, first, um, uh, what is the role of the molecular pathologist? Uh, not, not just a pathologist, but I think along with, with all the subspecialization specialization, uh, within pathology, uh, pathology departments really need a molecular pathologist. And, and can you uh, define that role in your experience with it? And the other is the question of uh, uh, re-annotation, that is reinterpretation of the sequencing report. You know, these reports are often, you know, are generated with clinical annotation and there's a specific um, interpretation based on what is known to be actionable. Uh, but with the pace of, of knowledge development, uh, those reports could easily be out of date in, in six months. And, and how does a, um, a clinical oncologist handle that? Yeah, those are great questions, and you've gotten to the heart of the challenge, particularly in the style of uh, much of American community practice. I think different for different segments around the world, but when physicians are seeing different tumor types during the same hour, and the reports are coming in from many different vendors. So we actually have found that to be our fastest growing population of professionals. We're now up to having a team of five molecular geneticists and pathologists. Um, we actually also, and this goes to the need to incorporate a bioinformatics platform like Genospace, we have the vendors send the raw data in. So there's a complete, as you said, re-annotation or a complete reinterpretation. So there will be a report issued by the vendor, but with regard to uh, what's curated in our trial menu, which we'll also do clinicaltrials.gov, um, it's, it's a complete reread. And I don't say that lightly, that's a big investment and that's something that I think a number of universities are moving toward, uh, but that's a, that's a real challenge for the world of oncology to, to begin to take that on. But uh, long answer to say, you hit the key points there. I mean, it can't be underestimated how difficult it is to look at all that data and to make sure that it fits for the day you're looking at it and not last year. Right, thank you. I think it's an important point you highlight there. Um, uh, Dr. Wu, uh, is, yeah. there a, is there a question that you would like to, yeah. uh, a point you'd like to raise uh, uh, off of uh, Skip's presentation? Yeah, so the, the, the thank you so much. The, the research is so, so excellent talk about the, the precise the history and the, the, his, the now the presentation and the, the near future. So in your presentation, you, we could saw the so many clinical try uh, on the US. So that developed the so-called embryo try or the basket try. So, but recently, so many, many tries named as the platform the clinical try. 
So could you explain the what is the difference between the Enbridge trial, Basic trial, or the platform trial? Yes, that's a that's a great question, Dr. Wu. Um, and you know, there's slight different variations of interpretation, but in in general, I think you know, uh, defining well the objectives and what we're looking at from a statistical review of the trial. So, for example, um, one possibility that's widely studied with regard to the the basket trial is to pick a particular drug that hits a certain target and then just allow any tumor type whatsoever that would be potentially affected by that one drug, that one therapeutic, um, you know, that would be a great approach. Uh, a second approach, which we talk about with the umbrella trial, is to aggregate a group of drugs that are put together for, for one particular reason. We picked one big pharma's commercial profile and studied it in an off-label setting. ASCO is doing the umbrella trial with a whole host of commercially approved drugs that are now being looked at in an off-label setting. And then actually there's a, a novel trial that we're starting that's gonna be looking at the variety of agents that are affecting the MAP kinase pathway and looking at tumor types that fit into a variety of different molecular profiles that would, would fit into that section. Um, and then people talk about uh, the platform studies where you're continually reinserting a, a new drug into this group of patients, trying to make quick no-go decisions, go no-go decisions on whether a therapy works or not. And we're doing that with a variety of IO combinations with one particular sponsor, um, checkpoint inhibitors as a basis, and then quickly looking at TIGIT and LAG3 and 41MOB as which one's the most appropriate. So uh, a, a great question. I think there's a lot of designs and the whole idea is to use as few of patients as possible. The patients are a precious resource to waste and getting the most we can out of each patient's contribution and give them the best chance to benefit. Yeah, th thank you so much. So I have the, another the comment and the, the questions for you. So about the HER2 the mutation. So the HER2 mutation first, uh, at all, all the amputation first uh, discovered in the breast cancer. And also recently the, the lung cancer also some interesting in the HER2 the mutation. So, but from the biological, such as you said, the, the biological may be so the bit the difference between the, the lung cancer or, or the breast cancer, the, 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 the same, the, the mutation. So, but now we have the, some of the tries, the, such as the Basaki try, we have one drug for the, the different the, the cancer type. So do you think that there's the something gap between uh, bio, biological the difference that but we use a drug to treat the different cancer type. So do you see the something gap or the how to deal the, with the, this the new uh, concept? Yeah. Great, great question, Dr. Wu. I think you hit on a key point and we're learning that um, in the ASCO mm -hmm. taper trial in some of the work we've done at Sarah Cannon with her two combinations and some sponsors are finding that what's a driver in lung versus colon versus breast are quite different. Overexpression, amplifications and mutations are quite different. And um, you really, I'd love to hear the other panelists thoughts on this maybe in, in a little bit as to how they would approach that. But I think you're getting to the crux of the problem in the, for example, in, in our HER2 experience in colon carcinoma, we have found that if you're a HER2 overexpressor, but you're KRAS mutated, you, you don't get the benefit. If you're mm -hmm. KRAS wild type and you're HER2 overexpressing, you do get the benefit of the HER2 therapy. So it's, it's more complicated than I made it sound. I think HER2 is part of the story in some of those tumors. And then there's places like in breast cancer where it's the driver and in other tumor types where it's just part of the story. So uh, again, the, the importance of having the whole profile. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Dr. Shao, um, do you want to uh, weigh in on that last conversation or, or pose a, a, a question for Dr. Burris? Sure, I think, uh, thank you for Dr. Burris' presentation. And uh, it's 
we are moving towards an era of tumor agnostic treatments. Uh, I mean, it's in, in, in the past in the past few years, FDA has proved two tumor agnostic uh, indications. However, uh, as as, we, as Dr. Berth mentioned, embarrassment that Berth mentioned, what's driving a mutation? What's driving a cancer in different in different tissue types? We have been troubled by this question by a long, long time. For example, BRAF mutation has been proven to be a driver in melanoma. It's also been proven to be a driver in colorectal cancer. However, drugs targeting BRAF mutation works really well in melanoma and not that well in, uh, in colorectal cancer. And what's, what's, what's different? What's, the, what's causing this uh, discrepancy behind, uh, beside, besides you know, being the same mutation? I think could be some of the biology, and um, it's. I think there, there are more, there are more to one mutation, in terms of uh, in terms of a cancer, in terms of a tissue type. So, moving towards and moving towards comprehensive testing and uh, combining combining different mutations together, could probably help us uh, understand this better. However, things get more complicated once you have in, in a typical tumor sample. Uh, at JGNSEQ, we see about six to 12 mutations and they're all different. And we, we identify one as the driver mutation, but what are the others? And are they all passenger mutations? Um, how does passenger mutations interact with driver mutations? Uh, I think to, uh, later we might, we are working toward, at our company, we're working towards a mathematical model. Uh, also together with Dr. Wu, we have a collaboration together. We're trying to think about what what can we do what what can we do when you combine the things together and you know, what what's different behind all this. Uh, that's uh, that's my comment, I guess. But for the, for for for, no, for doctor for doctor Berth, there's a question I uh, from the presentation. We mentioned uh, we we we, uh, we mentioned that uh, uh, TMB high being approved agnostically uh, in the United States. How 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 widely is it being used and how is it being received? Um, you know, interesting, and I, I think TMB, I, I was a little surprised, I made the comment, I was a little surprised with that approval. I don't know that we know the number, and I think TMB of 10 feels a little low, but there was excitement because um, that, that's a little bit lower bar to begin to give these well-tolerated checkpoint inhibitors. On the other hand, they're not inexpensive, um, and I don't, you know, the response rate's 29%, Good, but but not what we saw with some others. Um, MSI has become a standard almost by immunistic chemical staining in many scenarios. Um, but I, I think maybe one of the positives for the TMB approval is more patients will get next generation sequencing. Right now, the minority of patients, and, and I'd love Peter, Dr. Yu to comment on this too. In our experience across our practices, next generation sequencing is still done in the minority of patients and often done too late. So there hasn't been the, the TMB related uptake like you might expect. It's been mostly still within clinical trials. Um, many of the vendors now report it out. So, so in that situation, it's always acted upon, but still far too few patients are profiling. Peter, your, your experience on profiling? Yeah, that's an interesting question. You know, it, it um, uh, it begs the question of, of who to test, uh, when to test, when to reinterpret the test, and uh, uh, when to uh, consider things like uh, liquid biopsies uh, as well. So there's a whole, whole host of questions about, about not just the first test, but how do you reinterpret that test, and how do you do follow-up further tests as you get uh, clinical evidence of clonal um, uh, development of, 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 uh, of the cancer. Uh, I think it does vary somewhat between what you specialize in. Uh, I think our, our thoracic or lung uh, oncologists are, are quicker to do sequencing. Uh, those in areas like breast cancer, um, where there has not been so far as major an impact, are, you know, their clinical experience has been less rewarding. So we see some, some difference there. Um, you know, we have a problem because there are so many options for getting testing. Uh, our, our doctors can send it to an internal um, uh, lab for, you know, for sequencing, it's a smaller panel. They can go uh, commercially uh, to a variety of, of labs. And one of the things that I, I'm working on is trying to figure out who's ordering what and where they're sending it to and where's that report coming back from and how can we keep track of that 
um, and, uh, and make sense of it. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, uh, collaboration with our pathology departments and their laboratory information systems and trying to set up the ability to, to, to look at that. Um, I think the tumor boards are a good place. The molecular tumor boards are a good place where we have that discussion about when to test and who should test. Um, and also um, we're looking at some other enhancements to electronic health record with chemotherapy pathways. Uh, which will help, we hope, to, uh, to inform our clinicians when they need to do a sequencing test uh, because there is an actionable branch point in, in that decision tree. So uh, again, one of the challenges I, that we are facing. Um, I'd like to bounce back to Dr. Shao and one, mm -hmm. the give and take of the panel. Um, uh, one of the things that you made uh, your, in your remarks made me think about drug resistance. Now that mm -hmm. has been a, a lesson well learned in traditional types of chemotherapy uh, that we see drug resistance. Uh, we certainly see signs uh, of that with uh, short, short durations of response to some of the targeted therapies. And I've, I've often wondered is the experience with melanoma and um, uh, BRAF and MEK, is that a, a one-off observation where you combine uh, two um, targeted agents targeting uh, you know, a downstream pathway to circumvent uh, resistance. Is that, is that something that you are pursuing in your uh, mathematical analysis, you called your algorithm? Uh, you know, do we, should we see um, a, a different kind of trial design uh, that looks at a specific pathway? And I guess this also be asked to Skip and, and Elon, uh, that targets a specific pathway, looks at various downstream, upstream um, uh, targets and think about combination therapies. Sure, yeah. <clears throat> so um, from um, <clears throat> earlier, about 20 years ago, when, when I was still in university, we always had one uh, professor always gave me one, um, one lesson saying, if one drug kills one in a thousand, uh, one in a million, if a drug, if, uh, if, one, if, if you use one drug and the resistance is one in a million, and if you use two drugs and the drug is also one in a million, if you combine the drugs, you should be able to kill the cancer altogether. Because there'll be no resistance, and you know, because the, the chances will be so low. However, um, what we you know, what we see combinational therapies has been useful. Uh, it's not it's not as it's not as um, as um, an, an, an up to the statistical model as we imagined. And we think that if you could target one pathway really well, <clears throat> then we shouldn't target the pathway again. Com the combining combining the pathways should be more helpful than targeting one pathway uh, uh, multiple times. That's one that's one thing that we learn from our mathematical model mathematical models as well as from our um, from our observations. Also, um, from for resistance in the in terms of resistance, we see um, in, the, in, 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 in our experience, we see two types of uh, resistance. One we call primary resistance. Of course, that's uh, the, the drug doesn't work on the patient at all. We don't see a response at all. And even though it has the mark, it has the marker that we we uh, we were looking for. For example, some EGFR positive patients just do not respond to a lot. We I, we still don't don't know why. So we sequence the patients to to uh, to very high high depths. Trying to find out is is that there some clones we couldn't find? Is it is it we're not looking hard enough for odd mutations that's in there? That's one thing we are we are working on. This question is is harder, but an easier question is um, acquired resistance. Uh, uh, when uh, that we define this by uh, by uh, looking at a patient, a patient has at least has response, then uh, become non-responsive again. And in in, in this situation. We are looking for new mutations. Basically, we're comparing tissue samples or mutations before and after the treatment, and trying to find a difference in a batch of uh, patients that uh, that's in the same uh, that's in the same shoes. So, uh, in 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 this, um, we we actually publish a few papers in, on this ground. Uh, for example, uh, uh, for osimertinib, we we were able to identify. Um, 797 uh, C797S as one of the resistance mechanisms. In, 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 on this front, I think the, the question is easier, and we can probably move further. And uh, it's also interesting to uh, it's also interesting because that could also lead um, lead to new uh, new door new new pathways towards uh, newer drugs. 
Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, uh, scan some of the questions that are starting to come in from the audience. I think we now have over uh, 2,000 was what I think I saw in the chat box a few seconds ago, uh, listeners coming in. So here's a, a question. Um, I, how do you, um, I, with so many new um, uh, uh, targets being developed and some of them in relatively rare uh, tumors, um, how, and I'm gonna interpret this, uh, what is the right size of a panel, an NGS panel? So, um, uh, you know, is more better? And, uh, and uh, is that, how much should that weigh when someone's trying to decide what, what panel or what lab to send uh, for sequencing? Any comments from uh, any of the panelists? I'll start out by just saying, this is Dr. Burris. I, I start out by saying for where we are now, I think the, the more the better. Um, I don't know where that stops and I don't know that we need whole genome sequencing, but you know, we have learned as we, as we find out, and Dr. Shaw was alluding to it, some of the resistance issues. Uh, I think of like STK11 with immunotherapy. Too early to make a decision about that, but you know that seems to be an important factor as to why maybe patients aren't staying on immunotherapy as long. So there's other examples there where I think beyond just the the maybe one driver mutation or the one finding you think is a highlight. I, I think compiling all that data in the databases is going to help us sort through who's going to benefit and who isn't. But I'd love to hear uh, Dr. Wu, Dr. Shaw, their thoughts. Yeah, I, I think this is a very the interesting the, the questions, but uh, I think the, uh, more the NGS in the clinical practice, uh, we could find uh, too much the gene the alternation in the uh, one the patient, the tissue or the blood the sample. Uh, but the question is the, we need to know this the ordination, the, what is the, his, the uh, clinical, clinical meaningful, clinical significance. So maybe the most the gene the ordination only in the past not the driver. So if the, we are only based on this, the gene, the analyzing to design the, our, the combination treatment, I think maybe the most of the patient, most of the, the is the not uh, effective. So I, I, I think the next step, uh, if the, we are find uh, some, the uh, so-called the co-mutation or the so-called the alternation, we need uh, to understand what is the biologic. And then based on this knowledge, we could design the uh, rational and uh, effective the combination treatment. Uh, this is my point, yeah. So uh, I'll weigh in from the industrial perspective since uh, we, we, we uh, <clears throat> at, at GeneSeq, we uh, sequence over 10,000 samples per month. And I, I, I've been asked this question a lot by, uh, by physicians in China. When, when, how, how, how many genes should, should I be sequencing? And uh, well, I, one insight that I like to allude to is um, sequencing 200 genes versus say 1,000 genes, the cost is quite similar. It's, it's a little bit more because the sequencing cost is increased. But overall, for company running perspective, it's quite similar. It's not like say, saying sequencing a thousand genes is five times more expensive than 200 genes. Not at all, probably only 10% to 20% more. So the question becomes, is it worth it to, um, to get the extra information with maybe 10% more cost? Now, I, I think, I think we, um, we look at this question from two perspectives. One is clinical benefits directly to the patient. The other is research, uh, the research use that could be benefiting future patients. Uh, later on, but might not benefit this patient directly in, in the immediately. So <clears throat> uh, we, we've we been trying to uh, categorize different mutations into different significances for a long, long time. When we, we have a team that just uh, basically crawling over papers and, 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 and WCLC orals and ASCO orals trying to find, should we include more genes and more targets in our panel? And uh, they, they categorize them into different significant different kind of significance uh, significance as Dr. Yulong alluded to, and we include these in our panel 
according to this significance, uh, it's not sequentially. But that that that's uh, that, that's uh, that's uh, that's what we do. But the question really becomes: What do we report? Do we report all the mutations back to the to the to the clinicians? And do we report? Uh, you know, as Doctor Wu said, when you have too much information, it could be damaging and also could be confusing. So reporting is really, I think, that's the important thing here. We should report them. Uh, we should report them according to different tiers. It should make the report very concise and also very clear. And for for research centers like Doctor Doctor Bertha Center, who has the ability to re-examine our raw data, I think that that's what that's very interesting. That's also one thing we li we like to do uh, with, you know, with our Chinese uh, collab collaborates. That uh, for physicians could really and look at the data from raw again and not just from our reports. Reports is only a, a very um, slim and a very small percentage of the whole information basket in the basket. Thank you. I think that, that's a great answer. It, it reminds me of a, a common saying or adage in medicine in the United States that some people use, which is never order test unless you know exactly what you're gonna do with the, with the answer to the test. Uh, don't, don't just send it off and then, then later on worry about what to, how to interpret that. So I think that's some germane here as well. Uh, I have a couple questions from um, our audience that are uh, uh, will get us a bit off the topic of NGS to something a little bit different. So that's a little bit of warning for the panel. Uh, the first one comes from the United Kingdom. Uh, and it says in the United Kingdom, there is a two week wait uh, to obtain uh, urgent referrals uh, versus a routine referral pathway, which presumably would take uh, much longer. And um, the question, the, the, um, the uh, uh, audience member cites something called NG12 criteria. NG12 criteria used to determine the urgency. Is there anything similar in the US or China for physicians uh, that, that impacts the timing uh, and the modality choice for diagnostic uh, or, or procedures for um, uh, deciding on what cancer treatment? So I think they're specifically saying, um, is there a criteria pathway uh, that uh, moves somebody up in the queue for getting tests like NGS testing or other uh, diagnostic procedures as there appears to be in, in the United Kingdom? Uh, you know, I, I think uh, I, uh, speaking in the US, uh, um, I think the answer is is no. Uh, that's not part of our reimbursement uh, or public uh, policy uh, about getting um, uh, getting that. But the United States has a, you know, it's um, we call it an entitlement. Uh, so the philosophy here is that there is Skip is laughing because this is not necessarily a good thing, <laughs> but it may sound good. Uh, there's no fixed budget. There's no fixed national budget for um, for cancer care. Or healthcare in general, um, and so there's no um, there's no uh, pressure to um, pick uh, who gets to go first on a test. Uh, whereas obviously in the United Kingdom and many countries of the world, there is a a uh, national budget, and in the UK they have organizations like Nice that established a policy for determining uh, what the criteria is. Uh, I don't know what the answer is in in China. Peter, I'll just let me just add one quick comment before uh, our panelists weigh in. I had the same conversation came up last year in a conversation with the Australians. I will make a comment that in the United Kingdom, we have got some Sarah Cannon centers, one primarily in central London. And the most common reason that a, a British citizen will choose to pay for private health care insurance is cancer, because getting stuck in the queue is such a problem. Um, you know, that, that remains such a highlighted issue there, that, that Q issue of when it's your turn. Yeah, in, in China, I think this is a bit of problem for the, all the NGS tests. This is not reimbursement uh, by the, all the medical care the system. So uh, the patient with the test, the, the, the NGS, and they, they need to pay the by the service. So this is a, the big problem. Yeah, I hope that in the 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 next one or two or the three year, so the cost can go down, 
and then the patient uh, could the pay it. And also the, the China government also need to consider how to pay the, this testament. Uh, uh, Elon, just follow up on that. Um, is there any, um, uh, do any of the drug spot, uh, the study sponsors in China um, contribute to uh, paying for sequencing? Uh, because that's that would help them with the trial accrual. Um, no, that's uh, the 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 Louis Bird and not uh, paid by the government. So all but all the clinical trial we have uh, we 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 test by the uh, the the so called the clinical trial the, uh, the the money paid by the clinical trial, not by the patient. But in the clinical practice, the patient need to pay the by sale. I see. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, Skip, this is, this is a question addressed to you. I, I'm not totally sure I understand the question, but let me read a, a, a verbatim. Uh, it reads, in your slides, quote, trials phase one to three is now FIM to POC. Could you please tell me more about it since POC is generally phase two and the confirmatory trial phase three is still required by the FDA. Yeah, I, I understand that question. It's something interesting and we're beginning to see many pharma biotech wrestle with. Um, and I, I showed that rolling list of single arm approval. So the basic concept here is if you have a drug coming into the clinic that is targeted at one specific mutation, is it ethical? Does it make sense to even accrue a variety of patients should you be in fact narrowing in. And so for example, let's just pick a, a red inhibitor. If you have a red inhibitor coming to the clinic, you wanna know three things. You wanna know about the dose for it, you wanna know the safety and you wanna know whether it works. And so there's no reason to accrue patients beyond the RET mutations. And in that phase one trial, once you are getting to a a dose that's safe and has good pharmacology, pharma biotech expands at that point. And if you're not seeing sufficient responses, probably north of 50%, you probably don't have proof of concept. You probably don't have a drug that does what you thought it would do, and it's time to move on. So the more specific the drug is to a narrower population of patients, ascertaining proof of concept of activity and delivery in, in phase one or phase one B makes more sense than going through the traditional phase two or even phase three where there might not be equipose for a randomization. So that, that's the basic concept that why we're seeing more and more drug approvals based off of single arm expanded experiences. Yeah, I, I agree the, 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 with the broad uh, opinion. So uh, now the platform try so maybe some the some the arm also the uh, approval of the concept the clinical trial. So because the we are target the one the gene or the another the gene the alternation, and then we are try the, the drug uh, could fit or not fit. So I think this is also the pro, uh, the the, uh, the concept of probe the the, the trials. Yeah. So this is why the platform so much population in the global. Thank you. Uh, there's a question now uh, addressed to you, um, Dr. Wu. So I'll read that uh, to you. Uh, Dr. Wu, your recent yeah. article published in the New England Journal of Medicine on the use of oxyctinib for the adjuvant postoperative treatment uh, EGFR mutation non-small cell lung cancer has very good positive results. Would you please explain the impact of this article in terms of economic and social benefits? Oh yes, that is a good question there. So uh, the uh, Aldora trial uh, was designed in the uh, adjuvant setting for the the early stage of non small cell cancer after the recession. So now this is the positive result. And also the heart rate, so 0 0.17 0 and the 0 0.20. So, uh, but in the clinical practice, uh, we need to consider the, what is the cost uh, for the, this advanced setting. 
So, uh, uh, but I think the, the, if the patient the reduce the recurrence, so how to calculate this value? Uh, Dr. Yi, you also do the this, uh, because we are reduced the, uh, the, the recurrence risk of more than 20, uh, 80% <coughs> patient. So this is how to calculate this value. So, but I, I think the, the, the cost, the, this is the, uh, the social, the social, the uh, social the problem. I, we, we need the, the, uh, the government to, for the reimbursement. But now the FDA approved the drug in the admin setting. I think in, in, in the US, there's no problem because the, this is the good the investment by the medical care system. But in the China or the, another country, so we have the lot of work to talk, to discuss with the so many of the company. Uh, in the China in the least year, all the target drug, if the, you have the uh, indication, the price go down about 50% uh, until the 80%. So this is very, very low cost, such as the PDA1 inhibitor. Uh, now in China, one year, one year we are only need uh, about 100 uh, to, uh, to uh, 20,000 US dollar per year. So this is very, very cheap in the, the China. I think the economic and the science is different. Science is the, this is a, the true, the uh, change of the colonial practice, but economic, we are need the government and the, the, our the medical uh, doctor all the together to do, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a question. I'm not sure if we have the right people to answer this, but it's a very specific <coughs> question. How is the adoption rate of CAR T in China, uh, particularly for multiple myeloma? And, and then maybe there's a um, somewhat related question. Uh, we hear more and more about NK versus T cell therapies. Is there going to be a winner in this race? So uh, maybe a little bit about cellular therapies um, for malignancies, solid and, and liquid. As a so in, to, in, uh, yeah, in, in China now the cell th th uh, the cell therapy only uh, in the 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 leukemia and uh, also something in the lymphoma, but not on the solid tumor. So, but I I, I think that we need the strict. The, uh, clinical trial to confirm the efficacy. Uh, so I, I think this is very important. I also hope that in the uh, near future, we have the, some the evidence from the clinical trial to confirm that the cell therapy work on the solid tumor. But now I haven't seen the, any evidence for the solid tumor. Uh, Skip, any, any, what, what do you see coming down the road? Um, you know, I, I think the technology around this sort of cellular approach is probably going to move to an off-the-shelf uh, arrangement, a little more allogeneic, and probably that'll reduce some of the cost. And I think, you know, the real crux is we just need more patients on more clinical trials to sort through how this moves from some of the hematologic malignancies to some of the solid tumors and where it's relevant. Um, you know, just at a glance, I, it feels like not the kind of therapy to save that actually if we're going to use the impact of, of CAR, cellular approaches, TCR, that we probably need to be earlier up the line, you know, probably earlier in the metastatic setting, probably when there's less bulk of disease. So, Bruce, I have the question. Do you seem to have the future for the solid tumor, the, the, the cell therapy for the solid tumor? Sorry, was that addressed to Skip? Elon, I think, were you asking what the, the future looks like? I, I, I asked in the cell therapy, what the future in the solid tumor? Yeah. I think that's addressed to Dr. Morris, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, you know, uh, the solid tumor piece for, for cellular car TCR, I, I feel like um, the biomarker work and biomarkers that are specific to those certain tumors are, are still being worked out. I mean, I don't know that we've got the best for that type of approach. Um, I would say that I'm equally as enthused about maybe some of the bi-specifics as I am about some of the uh, car approaches. I see Dr. Shao maybe come out there, but certainly some of my smarter scientific friends believe that maybe this, the bi-specific CD3 combos might end up actually being the simpler way to approach this. Certainly we're seeing plenty of cytokine storm and plenty of reaction <laughs> with these types of approaches. Yeah, I think I think uh, I was wondering wondering about that. I'm glad you addressed the question of the bi-specifics as being a more nimble, maybe and less expensive version. So uh, you know, we spend a lot of time on this um, session talking about uh, next-gen sequencing type tests, and it's certainly appropriate for the title of this um, conference, the next big thing in cancer care. But I'm going to um, pose what I hope is a provocative question of what might the next next big thing be. Um, and are we um, getting a little bit too centered on, um, on the uh, uh, mutational, the DNA mutational analysis? And should we be thinking about gene expression more and more? So we've, we've talked about, you know, the, the um, uh, problems of resistance, uh, either primary or secondary. Uh, why does a patient who has a clearly actual mutation not respond to that? Um, is it um, some role of biology in there? Uh, is there some crosstalk with another pathway? Uh, can we, you know, tease that out, uh, uh, you know, mathematically? Um, but alternatively, should we be looking at gene expression? So should we just do a whole, whole gene expression analysis, look for overexpression and underexpression patterns, um, and then target um, uh, those type of um, um, messenger RNA uh, protein products. Um, there's been work, uh, some of it outside oncology, um, which has looked at uh, off the shelf drugs. So doing gene expression analysis, looking for certain hotspots uh, on heat maps, and then pulling off a drug that's uh, already approved for another indication, but its mechanism is known to impact a, a, uh, a pathway. So um, where are we in thinking about uh, messenger RNA uh, and then eventually proteomics. So maybe I'll start off by asking Skip, do you see um, uh, activity in phase one drug development that is based on that type of uh, analysis? Yeah, I mean, it, that's a, certainly an area we're trying to explore and discover. Um, you know, the debates, I've got folks that are certainly all in on proteomics and some that are, are more discounted. Um, but I think that's another place where it's going to be compilation of data. I, I think the acquisition of that information and trying to pull together in large groups of patients is, is probably going to be a good path forward, but uh, it certainly would seem to play a role. But I, probably our other panelists have got a little more expertise in terms of how you might apply that. Yeah, Dr. Shao, in, in terms of, uh, from, uh, you would identify yourself as an industry view, uh, is industry viewing this as a, as a, the next, next uh, uh, strategy, or, or is it uh, still kind of, uh, there's too much to work to be done on the, on the uh, uh, mutational analysis uh, for us to get into that yet? Sure, I, th I think uh, whether it's mutations or, or gene expression or proteomics, we should view them as just tools that would help clinicians and patients. It, for us, it doesn't matter if it's mutations or gene expression. It's uh, whatever that could help the patient. It could uh, help us create benefits and and hopefully create profits later on. That's that, that's our view. In in the end, you need to <clears throat> you need to be able to help the patients to be able to create value. So in in terms of gene expression, I think uh, the, the the major problem that we encounter in in practice um, in in research it works works really well. I mean we. We, uh, we, we probably have 5,000 patients that, would, uh, that have gone through the whole genome sequencing as well as gene uh, uh, profiling. But in, in practice, uh, the quality of RNA, um, having a hydroxy group made it much, much less stable. 
So when you have uh, in a, in terms of in a, in terms of DNA, we probably have five percent of samples that are below optimal quality for testing. For RNA, it depends on how you set the um, set the bar. Usually, it could be up to forty to eighty percent of the patients that that their samples are unfit for testing. So, really, uh, storage and um, and transportation are all big problems for RNA. And uh, I, no, uh, but for, for, from um, from an optim um, optimistic point of view, RNA DNA do not participate in biological activities directly. They need to be transcribed into RNA first, then they, they, they could not, they could not, they could be of use. So <clears throat> look at RNA could be more direct, um, but we we uh, transportation and storage is a big problem. Uh, uh, Dr. Pete, uh, Dr. Peter, you also mentioned uh, proteomics. The proteomics also definitely could be. Uh, it's also it's even more direct. You're looking at proteins. Uh, uh, proteins you know, participate in uh, in enzymatic reactions directly. The, but the problem with the proteomics is um, we have we also have a platform that looks at mass uh, mass spec uh, using uh, using different technologies to be able to look at proteomics as, as a whole. Mass spec is even more complicated. Proteins are very heterogeneous in their properties. DNA and RNA are very uh, comparatively homogeneous in their biological activities. Proteins, transmembrane proteins act differently. Uh, cytoplasmic proteins act differently. Nuclear proteins act differently. We, we Today, I don't think we have a way of profiling proteins comprehensively and effectively. We, we still don't have a, a, a very effective way. But definitely these are very interesting fields and definitely could be future directions. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, uh, all the panel. Uh, maybe in the future, the the, the polyomic is the, so much important. But I think the next step, the, we are need the DNA and the RNA the sequence the, together. Because the the gene the uh, gene the alternates are not only the mutation. We are also want to know the, the gene the expression and also the fusion the gene the fusion and another. So I think it seems that the next step the RNA and DNA all the together uh, the the for the so called the next generation. This is much important than that. And then the next next I think the maybe the protein. The protein omega also very important uh, in the, this. So I I hope uh, we could comprehension uh, analyzes all the data and then the develop the new the, the treatment strategies. Yeah. Great. So still very much a research tool, and the uh, industrial clinical applications technical issues will have to be uh, addressed once the uh, clinical goal is better defined. Um, I have another question here. And it is, um, what is the future of immune panels by companies like Fluigem Nanostrings that give 3D views of solid tumors? Or rephrasing the question, uh, what is the role of in situ oncoimmune panels for discovery and for therapeutics? Anyone want to grab that one? I'd go first just by saying I, I'd love to hear the answer to this. I mean, we've been talking about immune panels and I've seen variety of <laughs> demonstrations. We are not incorporating them yet at Sarah Cannon, but I feel like we should and we're, we're not sure which direction to go. So I'd love to hear the answer from our other experts. Dr. Wee, go first. Okay, so sure. And so um, there, probably in China and the U.S., there are a number of companies that have that have been sprouting in the past few years, looking at in situ 3D, uh, 3D imaging or single cell sequencing that hope that hopefully could help us uh, in, in a, on a, help our oncologists on the field. The, I think the major problem with the major problem with uh, this kind of technology is uh, the markers are not that intuitive. They're not intuitive to patients. Not they're not intuitive to clinicians. They're not intuitive to our uh, regulatory approvals. So uh, 
I think that I, I think you know, the, you know, we they are looking for a way to be able to sum all these features together and being able to weigh them differently and come up with a model that would that would be applicable in the field and also the regulatory officials would be able to understand what's going on. The partner, when we got our NGS panel approved in China, uh, we, we, we had a huge battle against uh, uh, the regulatory uh, uh, officials. They were not understanding what's the benefits of NGS and what is NGS and what, what, what how, 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 how does it help the patients? I think that the, the same thing might be happening in, the, in, in this single cell sequencing and in situ 3D uh, imaging field. Go, go ahead, Dr. Wu. Uh. Uh, yeah, thank you. So uh, I, I think uh, maybe so we have this huge the new technology in the uh, uh, cancer field. So how to use this uh, big data? I think the near future, I hope the AI and then the combination with the NGS with the other. So that's all the together. Maybe we have to, we are kept the, the find uh, some the regularly uh, the, for the biological the, the base, and then we could base on this data to develop our the clinical treatment space. So I think AI is the most important in the near future. Great, thank you. So uh, we are coming uh, pretty much up to the um, time of uh, uh, end of our meeting. And I'd like to uh, begin to uh, wrap that up by uh, thanking our panel members uh, for this very nice back and forth. It was, I think, quite enjoyable from my point of view and I uh, uh, love the give and take that we, um, we had today. Uh, once again, we'd like to thank the uh, sponsors of this, um, uh, of this meeting this evening uh, and thank them for their generous uh, support uh, and the uh, organizers uh, that brought together this uh, panel uh, today. So uh, with that, uh, I wish everybody, uh, um, we're all, I think on a weekend, I don't know, Ken, what time zone you're in, but a, a pleasant weekend um, and uh, a happy new year as we get closer to the Chinese new year. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you everyone uh, and, um, and uh, have a good year. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, everybody, thank you. Uh, Peter, thank you. Hi. Yeah. Happy new bye year. Bye. Happy new year. 基因是生命的起源，也是。啊？什么？那边也刚刚准备好衣服。哇！位于南京江北新区的基因检测公司适合基因，由一批在生物医药领域有突出贡献的北美归国华人科学家共同创建，致力于开展高通量测序技术，在精准医学领域的研究和服务，肿瘤。不应是一场宣判，是适合团队的创业使命。基因检测技术开启了癌症治疗的新时代。自二零一三年创新推出打 Panel 实体瘤 NGS 检测产品，经过七年多的市场耕耘，适合基因的检测产品不断优化更新，已积累中国肿瘤 NGS 基因组数据库样本四十万余份。这个庞大的数据为产品的优化和研发提供核心数据来源，也为中国肿瘤精准医学的发展提供了临床转化研究的基础。作为技术驱动型创新企业，适合基因尤为注重知识产权和人才培养。适合基因在北美设立名校全职技术研发团队，公司员工硕博占比达到百分之五十以上，已获得软件注册权四项。核心专利二十余项，发表 SCI 核心论文二百三十多篇，累计影响因子一千五百多份。适合基因拥有一万多平米的转化医学中心，临床检验中心已获得 CAP 和 CLIA 双认证，是江苏省发改委科技厅双认可的检验中心。二零二零年，适合基因获评南京独角兽企业称号。最具投资价值新锐企业等多项荣誉，严格的流程管理和可靠的检测质量是保证基因检测结果准确性的关键。小到耗材，大到产品检测流程，每一个细节都是质控的重要环节。
，适合基因，在肿瘤检测领域深耕细作，类似基于 NGS 检测技术的肺癌、多基因试剂盒等多项产品均为国内首创。同时，适合基因也在加速癌症早期筛查等领域的业务布局，为中国肿瘤精准医学领域的发展贡献力量。作为国内肿瘤 NGS 检测领域的领军企业，适合基因集团中国总部大厦正在如火如荼的建设当中。未来，适合基因将继续为人类精准医学的发展砥砺前行，让肿瘤不再是一场宣判。